we're going to let our children go. Hallelujah. We're a church that believes in the presence of God. We believe it. We enjoy it. I remember about 20 years ago, I was in the middle of the jungles in Tampico, Mexico with missionary David Hogan, and he, he gave me a 10-minute a warning that I was going to be preaching in the church in the middle of the jungles. 10-minute warning. So I had, I had to get my men to pray that I, I needed something to preach on. I wasn't expecting it. But the Lord brought me to this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Apostle Paul said, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. My message, my preaching but not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. That's why we need the presence of God every time we come together as a church because where his presence is, his power is there. He is his power. So, we feel that we need to seek God's presence. That's why we sing the songs we do. That's why we worship the way we do, and we will continue to do it, and we're going to get better at it. Praise the Lord. But we're going to be concluding our, our harvest series on harvest messages. We're going to conclude the series, but it won't be the last time you're going to hear about winning the loss for Jesus Christ. We began this series back in September. And at the end of August, our church attendance averaged 53 people in service. I remember when we first started, we was glad when we hit 30. And I uh, said, wow, we had 30 people today. At the end of October, we averaged 7, 74. Well, at the end of September, we averaged 62. We went from 53, 62, the end of October, 74. Last Sunday, we had 81. So we must be getting the message that is being preached uh, from the Word of God. So this Tuesday night, as the announcements told you, that we were going to be having a harvest banquet and... Uh, we're going to celebrate the harvest that God has given us in this church, and it's just the beginning. So this Tuesday night, we're going to celebrate that. But more than that, we're going to have the hope of a greater harvest, that this is not all of it, that there's much more that this church is going to get. And we charge you $10 to come. And uh, we did it for two reasons. One to help with the expense, which it won't cover. But number two, we know that if you pay up, you will show up. <laughs> we've done it many times. Say, no, we're going to just pay for everything, and, and people haphazardly show up. I figure if you put your 10 bucks up, you're going to make it. So, and if you don't have the 10 bucks, we'll put it up for you, but we want you there. So we're looking forward to this banquet. We're going to hear some great testimonies of salvations. The last message I spoke on this series, I titled Expectation of the Harvest, because there's really no greater work than we can be doing. That's why when the Lord called me into the ministry, I gave up my profession, my occupation, because I knew that in the end of my life, that nothing would matter more to God than winning people to Christ. In fact, he told me all the things that I was accomplishing in my life, my businesses, I began making more money than I ever, ever dreamed about making in my life. And the Lord said, oh, that's fine. He said, but in the end, 
It counts for nothing. Whatever we build for ourselves, whatever we have, as much money you put in the bank, as much property you own, much fame and fortune you have, in the end, he brought me to the end. None of that stuff's going to count. The only thing that's going to count is what you do for me and for the kingdom work, eternal things. And I want to tell you something. The only thing you're going to bring into eternity is souls. You're going to bring your, your cars. You're not going to bring your houses. You're not going to bring your money. You're going to bring any of that. The only thing we can bring over with us is going to be souls. That's when I realized I'd take him up on his on his offer to preach the word. So uh, there's no greater work than we can do than to bring someone to the Lord Jesus Christ and see the blessings. My wife and I have been doing this 40 years, and I want to tell you we've seen it over and over and over again. Somebody comes in broken, downtrodden. They come to Christ, and all of a sudden, the windows of heaven opens up for them. And, be, and God begins pouring out blessings in their life. Because you see, if Jesus Christ is the answer to our life, it's the answer to everyone's life. What has happened to you can happen to them. And I remember when God called me in the ministry, I told him, I, 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 this, this is not my deal here. I didn't go to... Bible college, I didn't do any of that stuff. I don't even speak well. He said, just say what I say. In other words, just preach this. It's all you have to do. You don't need to be no uh, theologian. Just say what I say, and you'll see the power of my word when you preach it. And he did. So if we are recipients of a miracle of salvation, that, remember, was absolutely free. Didn't cost you anything. Didn't cost me anything. Cost him everything. So if we got it for free, it stands the reason we ought to be able to share it. So God saved us. You know, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But... but he not only saved us because he loved us, he saved us that we ourselves might be a witness to a world out there lost and dying of his love. We are the reflection of his love when the world sees what God has done for us, they will realize God can do it for them. So I asked the question, and I believe it's the same question the Lord would ask of us. How much are we willing to sacrifice to see people saved and set free from sin and bondage? How much? What is the limit of what we're going to do to see people saved, to see lives changed, to see marriages healed and families brought back together? How much are we willing to pray? How much are we willing to reach out? Jesus said the harvest is ready already. How, mu how much are we willing to go and get it? So I titled the message today, How Far Will We Go? You got to ask yourself that question. See, it's easy to call ourselves Christians, but we must never forget that the one that we're following, the one we're professing is our example in life, remember we never can forget that this is where he ended up. He gave it all. So if he's our example, then we can't do anything less than giving our all for the kingdom. We're following someone who gave it all. And to save the world, which we are included, thank you, Jesus, that he included us in it. And uh, we don't realize how dark this world really is until God takes you out of it and puts you into his marvelous light where all of a sudden now you can see what you were living in 
and what God has brought you into. The Gospel of Mark gives us an example of how far some people went to bring somebody to Jesus. So let's look at it. It's a real example. In Mark chapter 2, verse 1, it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came carrying a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get in to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law was there, were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why did this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Pastor Joseph used this story recently when he preached on taking up your mat. When Jesus healed the paralytic, Jesus told him, Pick up your mat, which represented his old life that he was lit, he was uh, spent his life on, pick that thing up. Pastor Joseph on on, on leaving our old position in life and using it as a testimony. The people who witnessed this miracle said, we had never seen anything like this. Now, this was not just because of his physical healing, which he got, but also the fact that Jesus forgave his sins. That was an amazing thing. They've never heard that before. When Jesus changes a life, you can't believe it. You can't even explain it. You don't know how it happens. That's why new converts to Christ influence more people than those who have been saved for 100 years sitting on church pews. See, some people look at those people, they might look at me and say, oh, you've been like that all your life. No, I haven't. But when you see somebody coming out of darkness into his marvelous light and there's such a dramatic change in somebody's life, then they, that's something to look at. That's why a growing church, which this one is, if you've been around us struggling for five years to get to the place we are now, you will know that a growing church will be a church whose heart is evangelism to see people saved. Pastor Joseph preached on this man who was healed and picked up his mat. The paralytic was the main character outside of Jesus himself in this story. But I want to expound on some other people here. There's other people here. I want to expound on the people who actually were just as important in this story as anybody else, and that is those people who brought this man to Jesus. Because without them, the story wouldn't even happen. Think about it. Without those men, this story wouldn't even be here. See, what, we read the stories about Jesus and the crippled man and I, how God would God. No, what about those guys? 
What about those people who decided to bring their friend, whoever it was, we don't know, because without them, the story would not have happened. So let's examine the story. Jesus went home after he had a great start in his ministry. This is the very start in Jesus' ministry. If you read chapter 1, he went home and, and to rest, really. How many know there's no rest in ministry? <laughs> but he tried to rest, but he went home. But in chapter 1, the start of his ministry, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. The Holy Spirit came down upon him, filled him up. He was led in the wilderness. He was tempted for 40 days, 40 nights by the devil. He beat the devil down. Then he called his first disciples. Then he went to a synagogue. He cast out a demon. Then he healed a man of leprosy. What a start. That's how he started. Then he went home to rest. I'm going to tell you again, there's no rest in ministry. The people heard about it, filled up his house. It got, it, there's no time to rest. I'm telling you, ask Pastor Joseph. I'm in Abita Springs. I'm away from y'all a bunch of times, but I still get phone calls. People, they crowded the house, filled the house. People outside, they were standing all outside the house. So what you going to do? You had to start preaching. That's what you do. If they gather, you preach. They want to hear, you preach. So in verse 2, it says, So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Four men carried a paralytic to bring to Jesus. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us who these men were, whether they were friends or family, neighbors. It don't matter. You see, I wonder what they were. It don't matter who they were. It doesn't really matter. All these men knew is that this man, whoever he was, needed Jesus. They were men that had a burden for the man. See, you'll never reach a sinner unless you have a burden for him. Unless you see him drugged out, drunk out, in immorality, whatever the case may be, drunk, drugs, whatever, unless we have a burden for these people, you ain't never going to reach them. We must have a burden for the harvest. Say so the harvest is out there. Jesus is out there. And I want to tell you, it's out there. And everything we need as a church is out there. See, we, 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 we got a nice little worship band here, but this ain't all we're going to get. Right. See, we need some more guitar players. We need, <laughs> we need probably some drummers, saxophone, clarinet, all of that tambourine, whatever the case may be, bongo drums, whatever, whatever. We, we want it all. But guess where it's at? It's out there. God has given people gifts and talents that they're using for the devil. We got to get them where they can bring them in here and glorify God with the God-given gifts. God gave them those gifts. The devil didn't give it to them. The, the devil put them in those places. But the devil didn't give them the gifts. All good gifts come from. So we don't know anything about these men. We don't know what their ages were. We don't know what their positions in life was. Again, that doesn't matter. We don't know how they heard about Jesus or how they even heard that Jesus could heal this man. We don't know that because Jesus' ministry just got started. So. This is what we do know about them. They cared for the man. They had a burden for the man. Don't you have a burden to see somebody crippled and can't, can't do anything? They cared enough for this man to carry the man and take him to where Jesus was. Now, we don't know how heavy the man was. Oh, we know it took four guys to carry him. 
Now, maybe Pastor Joseph might have struggled with him by himself. I don't know. But all my, all my grandson, Jeremy, who, who's a, these guys are strong. But it took four men to carry this one man to Jesus. Now, we, we do know he, he had to be heavy for four guys to, to bring him. See, bringing people to Jesus sometimes is a heavy load to carry. I mean, I can't carry this load with this anymore. No, you might need some help. Sometimes it takes more than one of us to bring people to Jesus. We don't know how far they had to carry the guy. You might say, oh, I've been dealing with this person for years now. I've been dealing with this one for years. Been dealing, oh, man, how long am I going to have to put up with this people, with this guy? We don't know how long and how far they had to carry the man. But we do know this. If they didn't do it, the man would have still been in his condition. The man would have stayed in his condition. We wouldn't even be talking about this story right now if they didn't decide to do it. I want to tell you something. There's a lot of stories out there right now that we could go get if we have the burden to do it. There's a lot more. They've got some stories in here. You're going to hear Tuesday night. There's some stories in here that because we came here and to do what Jesus told us to do, then we got stories. But I want to tell you, there's a multitude of stories out there right now if we could just get our hands on them. But guess what? We ain't going to walk through the door. We got to go and get them. We can't leave the harvest that is right here in our reach. See, this was not the case in the early church. The early church, I want to tell you something. You got to read the book of Acts. That's why I got out of a religious organization 20 years ago because every time I read the book of Acts, I said, somehow we're not doing what they did. These people were fanatics. They preached everywhere they went. They healed the sick, raised the dead. They didn't care. Nothing stopped them. You see, they were under persecution. And I want to tell you, I think persecution's coming. You don't believe it? Watch the news. Watch it. You stand up for Jesus, they're coming after you. I keep saying we're going to get a bunch of people and run through Walmart and shout Jesus. Just shout it. You're going to see what happens. <laughs> You'll see what happens. Let's just go through there, down the aisle, shout, start shouting Jesus. And you're going to see what I'm talking about. In Acts chapter 7, the disciple Stephen was stoned to death. The first one to go was Stephen. Besides Jesus, he was the next one to go. Stephen was stoned because he was believing exactly what we believe now. He was stoned for it. And this government's turned against this. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Saul was there giving approval. To his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Okay, you want to bring the persecution on? Do it. You're going to throw us out of this building, do us right. But wherever we go, we're going to preach the gospel. See, no matter what, we're going to preach the gospel. We can't let anything stop us. The church knew that even under persecution, the word of God is still powerful. There are places in the world right now you can't preach this gospel. You would die 
if they caught you preaching this gospel today. There are places, countries in the world, you can't do it. But the early church persecution didn't blind them to the harvest. I don't care what the government says. We can still look at the harvest and see these people suffering. We can't say, well, the government said we can't do it. No, we're going to still do it. The believers were scattered, all dispersed all over the world. Where they were scattered, it seems like God was sowing seed everywhere. Think about that. Sowing seed everywhere. Everywhere they went. I tell you what, this ministry sowed some seeds after Katrina. We had 600 people in Shelmet Church. We had probably 150 leaders in that church that after Katrina, they went everywhere. They were all over the south. I had pastors call me, you got any more like this? They would go and set churches on fire because that's what they knew they had to do. I had pastors saying, you got any more? I said, got any more? I'm struggling now. I only got 80 left here out of 600. We went to Covington to start that. God used the evil of the world to spread his followers and the gospel all over the world. Just remember, I don't care how bad it gets. God knows what he's doing. They didn't run and hide like many churches did in COVID-19 pandemic. Some of them churches didn't even come back. They got scared of the government. They got scared of the pandemic. The early church didn't hide in secrecy. They had seed to sow. We do. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Preaching the word means this, to evangelize and win souls. That's it. That's what we got right here. Two things we're going to do. We're going to win souls and make disciples. That's it. We don't do anything else. We don't have bells and whistles here. We're just going to win souls and make disciples. We're committed. See, when you're committed to a church like this who's bent on discipling and training people, you will see the harvest brought in. You're going to see it. If we keep doing what we're doing because God keeps proving it to us, you will see the harvest brought in for Jesus that we all fall under the same commission. Right there, that's why it's on the wall. This, we all are responsible for this. But you see, Jesus never said it was going to be easy. We're living in a time today, everything, we want everything easy, we want everything fast. It don't happen that way. Jesus never said it was going to be easy, and I'll tell you, 40 years of this, I can tell you, it hasn't been easy. But I tell you what, it's not impossible. It's not impossible. There are obstacles in bringing people to Jesus. There's some things, <laughs> they're going to be in our way every time we try to do it. It took four men to carry the paralytic to Jesus. It might take more than one of us to win somebody. It might be three or four of us to get somebody here. We're going to face obstacles. It wasn't, if it, it was hard enough for these, for these men to carry this man to Jesus. I know it wasn't easy. The thing is, that was hard enough to pick the man up, and I don't know how far they had to carry him, but they picked him up and they carried him, and then they faced another obstacle. When they get there, they can't get in. I can't wait till it happens here where people standing outside can't get in. We have to put speakers out there and just preach the word out there like we did in a parking lot when we first got started. They couldn't get in. So what do you do? You quit? Well, we carried this man for a mile and a half. We're tired. Now we can't even get in the place. That didn't stop them. The church has to learn to overcome some of the obstacles in reaching people for Jesus. We did. Uh -huh. Past five years to get here. We didn't get here by accident. We started in a house, ended up in Dunkin' Donuts. 
Bar Church on Saturday night, Ramada Hotel on Sunday. <laughs> huh, Nick? <laughs> Nick trembles when I say that. Nick, we had to unload the trailer every Sunday to go to. So I want to tell you, it's no accident. We've been fighting obstacles for years. We still got something to fight. We can't give up seeking God because breakthrough's coming. <laughs> breakthrough's coming. It's around the corner. Four men didn't get discouraged, but they looked up and they found their solution. See, we will never overcome the obstacles by looking down. We can't say, oh, no, what are we going to do now? Psalm 121, 1 and 2 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You got to lift your eyes up when the obstacles come. This church will never face an obstacle that God will not get us through. Never. Never. Jesus said, lift up your eyes. Look on the field. They'll wipe for harvest. If we don't look up, and see the harvest field, we're never going to get it. It's not going to be us four no more. There's more out there. You know, we came here, I'm looking around here, got churches on every corner here. Churches on every corner here, but they're not full. And then they got unsaved people all around here, hundreds, thousands. We will never see the harvest looking down. They looked up and they saw the answer. We got to get this man up on the roof. What? Get him up on the roof. It's not only going to be tough if it took four men to carry him. How many men did it take to get him up on the top of the roof? But not only that, it's going to cost you something. Do you realize when they got up there, they said, you know, we're going to have to tear up somebody's roof here. I don't know whose house this is. <laughs> I got to rip this roof off. I don't know what it's going to cost us, but we got to get it off. We're going to have to tear up somebody's roof. And now think about that. Just think about this right now. Just think about this. This place is packed. People waiting outside. And all of a sudden, you see some of these towels start breaking through. Got four guys up there letting somebody down. Huh? You imagine that, what that looked like? You imagine what those people, what's going on here? Boom, paralytic man right in front of Jesus. They thought to themselves, whatever it's going to cost. We still have to do it. Sorry to say, it's going to cost us to get some people saved. But God's going to show us the way and he's going to want to know if we're willing to pay the price. I just imagine every time I read that story about, I mean, you know, stuff had to start falling. They didn't take everything off. Stuff had to start falling. We don't know what the scene's going to be to get somebody to Jesus, but I want to tell you, it's always worth it. I don't care what we go through, it's always worth it. See, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, now I want you to watch this here for a second. When Jesus saw their faith, whose faith did, they, did he see? Whose faith? He saw the faith of those who brought the man. He didn't say anything about the man. He said when Jesus saw their faith and what they were willing to do to get that man to him, Jesus saw their faith. I want to tell you something. Jesus recognizes that. All the work you go through to get somebody saved, don't think Jesus doesn't recognize it. 
It says, when Jesus saw their faith, that's us right here. It was the man who brought the paralytic. See, God honors those who bring people to Jesus. God honors them. The Lord takes us into consideration when we have a burden for the lost. God looks at us. We have to keep our eyes on a reward. There's going to be a reward. I've been thinking about the reward for 50 years now. I'm going to get mine. Paul told Timothy, listen, I'm going to get my crown. He said, but don't worry. There's one for you. If you do what I do, you're going to get one too. As hard as it may have been to get their friend to Jesus, and all they went through, all they went through, it was worth it. It was worth it. Jeremy, I want to tell you something. It took four men to bring that man to Jesus. Four. But they didn't have to bring him home. He walked himself. See, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> as much as it took to get him there, you didn't have to carry him home. He walked by himself. And I want to tell you, there's going to be a lot of struggling to get people here. All the work you had to do to get them here. But once they get here and Jesus touches their life, forget about it. They'll be here next week on their own. On their own. He walked home a new man. See, and then when you see that, you know, it's like a woman giving birth. You know, you're going through all the pain, boom, 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 and then all the crying, all of the, the, the hee-hawing and everything that goes down. <laughs> My wife was the worst, but I wasn't there. Back then, they wouldn't let us go in. I thank God I didn't go in. <laughs> but after the baby's born and everything's different oh look what I got here <laughs> so all that we go through to get people say all oh, that you the, the struggling and everything that you had to go through to get somebody here after they get saved and you see their life changed they're a totally different person. You can't believe it. You can't believe it. When a miracle happens, you can't believe it. See, the religious leaders, they had religious leaders in that room because when Jesus did what he did to the man, they, 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 they didn't like it. It wasn't their method of doing things. See, the religious leaders opposed Jesus' method of ministry. But when the miracle happens, it shuts all the mouths. 30 years ago, when I took on this ministry in Chalmette, the church is already 40 years old. So this ministry is over 75 years old. So it's going to be around a while. It was in a religious structure when I became pastor and I began realizing that if something doesn't change here, we have to close this place up. So God began to show me what needed to be done to reach the lost with the gospel. God gave me a vision. What needed to be done to reach the lost with the gospel. God gave me the vision. The religious leaders didn't like it. I told him I wasn't backing down. I got to do what God tells me to do with the while, with or without your approval. So they didn't like it. They left the church, went to another church. They talked about me, how I was ruining the church, and all the things that I was going to do was going to ruin the church. Many of them left, went down the street to another church, Two years later, they watched the church grow to 600 people. 
See, when the harvest comes in, it shuts the mouths. As crazy as Brother Carl was, somehow God blessed him. No, I just did what God told me to do because I was willing to pay the price. I was willing for them to throw me out of the church. In fact, I told them. I said, you men, I said, this is what we can do. I said, we can get the church together and we can take a, we can take a, a, a vote whether they still want me as their pastor. I challenged them. They didn't take me up on it. I said, but if that church wants me, then you guys got to find another place to go to church because I'm going on with God. See, I was willing to pay the price to win a loss. That's all I wanted to do. I wasn't worrying about growing a big church. I just want to win the loss. Let God take care of the church, the buildings, whatever else God's got to do. Let's put our heart on the loss. This church needs to pray for your pastors and leaders here because we're going to be attacked by critics. There's no doubt about it. God has a plan for this ministry, and if we're faithful to follow it, as he keeps revealing it to us, there's going to be results, just like the results in Jesus' ministry to the paralytic man. In verse 12, he got up, took his mat, and walked out. In full view of them all, they amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. When a person's life has changed so dramatically, people know this can only be of God. And I want to tell you, what we've done so far in this ministry, when we started, I was passing two churches. I was passing the one in Covington while I was trying to get this one started. I was working two at one time until this one got to the place I had to make a decision. I can't do both. I came here. But I want to tell you something. I watched the hand of God move. It hasn't been easy. But I want to tell you something. We, we reached a lot of people, huh, Pastor? We reached a lot of people. They, all, they stick with us, but we ministered to a lot of people. We ministered to a lot of people. See, when a person's life has changed so dramatically, people know this can only be of God. The best advertisement for church is not the media. We can have big signs. We can get on uh, Facebook and, and, and Instagram. All, all this stuff, we can keep doing that. But nothing is, is better than a life that has been changed, that goes back to their family, that goes back to their friends. There's no advertisement that beats. Listen, when our church grew in Chalmette to 600 people, we didn't advertise one bit. See, a changed life shouts louder than any media could do. More, any flags we can start flying. Because the early church, they prayed for boldness to do this. And it's not going to take a church full of wimps to get it done. We're going to have to be bold. The early church was under persecution. We're not yet. But they were, it didn't stop them. Let's look at how they prayed, the early church, how they prayed. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and in mind. That's where this church has got to get. We got to be all in one heart and one mind. We all got to speak the same language. We're going to win the lost and disciple them. Nothing else. Here are the essentials that we need to pray for. We need to ask the Lord to fill us with his Holy Spirit. The church knew they needed the power that 
Nothing is going to happen without the power. Nothing. We have corporate prayer on Sunday morning here at 9 a.m. Years ago when I was pastoring the church in Covington, we were having morning prayer just like we're having now. We need more people in there. It was Easter Sunday morning. There's some people here who remember this. It was Easter Sunday morning. We were praying in the, in the prayer meeting before service for the power of God to manifest in the service. I got to the pulpit. As soon as I mentioned the title of my message, I had to cast out a demon a woman manifested in the church. I didn't even get started preaching. I had to cast demons out. We need boldness to speak and to witness. Not fleshly boldness, but Holy Spirit boldness. Not stupid boldness, Holy Spirit boldness to speak the word of the Lord. Now, to speak the word of the Lord, you got to know the word of the Lord. You got to know the word. You need to study the word. You need to commit yourselves to the word. We need to be of one mind and one heart. This body of believers got to operate as one body, living and breathing and going after the same thing. We need to be one with the vision of this church. We need to be at one with the leadership and pray and support them. I want to close with this scripture and encourage us as a church today. In, Levit in Leviticus 26, verse 8 to 12, the Lord said, five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase 10,000, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you have to move it out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you, be your God, and you will be my people. How far will we go to win a soul? This church has proven it. It's going to do whatever it's going to take. From whence we begin to where we are now, and we will continue with God's help. If you're here today and you've never had your sins forgiven, as this paralytic man in the Bible, I want to let you know that this church has done everything it could and done whatever it took to get this church here. I remember 50 years ago when I walked into a church, long-haired, dope-smoking hippie, I had no idea that people gave to that church for me to walk in and have my life changed. So this church is here because people worked and struggled to get it here. Nobody gave us this building here. Nobody. We had to put a lot of money in here. And it's here for you. It's here for anybody who walks through that door that needs Jesus, free of charge. I want to let you know that if you're here today, just so that you would have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want us to stand up right now. I, I was driving in my car this week. I don't know where I was going. I think I was going to the grocery and I heard a song that I want us to sing because I believe it's the type of song that if you got saved here today, you'd be singing this song on the way home. So I want us to sing it right now.